What's happening? We're at the Bottom Dose Beer Club. We're here at Ballast Point in beautiful Long Beach, California, San Diego Brewery. Made a beautiful restaurant brewery here in Long Beach, California, right on the peninsula. Let's go in and check it out. Yeah, hello. Hey. Happy birthday. Let's go in. Belly of the Beast, right here. Corner, corner, corner. Okay, corner, corner. I just, corner, 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 corner. Yeah, okay, goddamn. I'm sorry, everybody, that we're in your guys' way. So, uh, I want to keep it simple. What we're going to do is we're just going to do a, a quick uh, kind of carne asada skirt steak. Uh, we're going to pair with some Mexican rice that we whipped up real quick right now. And uh, mango chimichurri with some burnt avocado to go over it. And, you know, trying to keep it simple, trying to keep it light. And then uh, Chef June is gonna prepare you guys uh, the Bisaya ribs that are on our menu. And that's one of like a big popular items that we sell here. Fantastic, we love carne asada, don't we? Let me get the grill. Nice I don't wanna get in their way, you know what I'm saying? Like this is a working kitchen. We are here in a working kitchen. This isn't, this isn't Guy Fury. I love you Guy Fury, go Raiders, but this is, this is during prime time. Long Beach location is very busy. These people are running. They are working their ass off right now. And we are privileged to see what's beyond. This is just uh, herb oil, salt, pepper, a little bit of granulated garlic, uh, a little bit of sugar. That's it, just to give it a little bit of uh, sweet and salty. Let go, not disturb it, let it cook. And then, um, yeah, let it, let it roll. So over here, I'll start plating one of them. Okay. So you guys have it like already ready to show. So I'll have this one already. Kind of this one's ready to go? Yeah. We'll wait until he comes back. Oh, he's bringing the Mexican rice. Oh, wonderful. A little generous amount. Who doesn't like Mexican rice? Hey, it almost looks like my nana's nana oga right there. Look at that! Look at those colors. Like I said, I did have this one already ready. All right, don't put this one in the show. Let me slice it first. Make sure that it's the right temperature. Oh! Ho, 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 ho. Good, huh? That's beautiful. Look at that. That's like perfect coloring for me. Got a little mango chimichurri. Mango puree, uh, parsley, cilantro, mint, uh, chili flakes, just to add a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of acid to the steak. A little bit of green onions on top, because why not? Then we're gonna get this avocado here. Wow. 
Oh, here we go. We're about to get into some fun action here. What does charring the avocado do? Gives it a nice smoky flavor. Okay. And it changes the texture a little bit of it. Fantastic. Wow. This one here is for you guys to enjoy. This one's for us. This is for you guys. <laughs> I guess I'm first up then since I'm holding the mic, huh? This one's yours. We still got one more cooking up over here. We still have one more cooking up. Put this one off to the side, right here. Let it rest a little bit. If you don't want to cut into that right away. Well, make sure that it has time to rest. That's right. You always gotta let your meat rest. In the meantime, I'm gonna put this over here. Okay. Over here on this side. Oh, we're moving on. We have uh, one of our well-known items that we serve here. It's called uh, the Bisaya ribs. Bisaya. Uh, province of the Philippines. Uh, we, uh, both me and Chef June here. So Chef yeah. June is actually from Bisaya. Uh, the name of my place, and then my mom uh, used to cook these ribs, and then uh, we brought over here. So people like it. The chef one like it. Uh, I love yeah. it. So me growing up, I ate a lot of obviously Mexican food, Mexican. So I had a lot of carne asada and stuff from all Mexico. But then, a uh, little background story, met my wife 10 years ago, she's Filipino, and ever since meeting her, I, I've been eating nothing but Filipino food, and so that's why we, on our menu you'll see there's a lot of like Mexican influence, but also there's some like Filipino flair to it as well. Uh, why? Because, you know, we like to put our backgrounds into, into the food that we cook here, and also the community around, you know? That's absolutely right. We have Filipinos in our family as well. It's there you go. So, very relatable. So these are marinated overnight. Uh, then we grill them off. We cook them. By these, I'm gonna put them back on the grill just to give them a nice char. Wow. You can hear that sizzle. It's fantastic. Can you hear that? Oh my goodness. I'm gonna have a little beer here while we wait. That's ours, right there. It's fantastic. So this is like my dream. I love Filipino food, I love Mexican food. You can find all that at Ballast Point. Oh my God, here in Long Beach. And probably all the other Ballast Point locations as well. Oh, here we go. What sauce is this? So this is what we call the, uh, what would you call it? I would call it, uh, I guess for Filipinos, it would be like Mang Tomas. Yeah. And then we um, we take in the sauce, that, those are the ones. We put yeah. some honey in there, orange juice, lime juice, pineapple juice, there's a lot of stuff in there, a lot of garlic. All the good stuff. The flavor of course. Yeah, when I say Mang Tomas, is this uh, it's a Filipino sauce. Right, dude? It tastes like mantomas. It tastes like right mantomas? Yeah, it's okay. not mantomas, but it tastes like, it's like we're trying to replicate it in a way. But that's why, you know, uh, like I said at home, when we barbecue, that's what we, you know, we put on our barbecues, it's mantomas. So it's a... Uh, mantomas. Ma mantomas. Yeah. So we call it, uh, on our menu, we just call it like a sweet barbecue sauce, because it has everything that a barbecue sauce would have, uh, but it has that Filipino flair. Put it a little bit in the sauce. Just a little bit, that's all you need, that's huh? You, need. you just wanna get your grits a little bit of that flavor, and that's it. You don't wanna overwhelm uh, the palate, because it could be a little sweet. And you wanna taste the, the char on the on the ribs, you wanna, you wanna taste the marinade on the ribs, and you wanna taste the, the meat itself. And you know, if something's putting too much sauce on it, it can, can ruin that. 
those look beautiful. Can we keep it simple? We just uh, plate them with a little bit of steam rice. Gorgeous. Look at those ribs. Some grilled bok choy. Oh boy. Here we go. And then we grill them on the, on the flat top. Just, you know, you gotta have a little bit of veggies. Well, Filipino families, the bok choy. Yes. Just to add a little bit of color to the ribs. A little bit of green onion. Then we just top it off with a little bit of Thai chili peppers. Just to add a little bit of heat. Not too much. Add a little bit of color, but for those people who like spicy, you know, take a bite of those and they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna be wanting to scope them real quick. <laughs> if you can, if you could smell the aroma that I'm smelling, it is, it is fantastic in here. Now those are on the menu. These are on the menu, yeah. So that's one of our like, really popular items. Uh, it only in Long Beach? Only in Long Beach, yeah. Only in Long Beach can you get these ribs only in Long Beach. from Ballast Point. Like I said, they're very popular. We tend to sell out uh, fairly quickly. Uh, but we, we do our best to keep up and make sure that they're always available for the guests. But like I said, uh, they take a little bit. They take time. They take love. So, you know, uh, people enjoy them, man. We're, we're very proud to serve them. They're beautiful. Everything so far has been beautiful. Yeah, that's it. I think this, you guys can take this back and enjoy them. And yeah. You know what you guys do, you have a, do you have a fork at all right here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to try these right now. I can't wait. I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, we're in the kitchen. If you pan out, I mean, people are all, they're busy doing so much stuff. We got fryers. We got sauces. Filipino sauces. We got rice. Chips, guacamole. We got so much shit going on right now, guys. There's bread right here. There's meat over there. There's just so much going on. And this is what happens at the Long Beach Palace Point on a Saturday in the middle of August or in the beginning of August. I don't even know what date we are. In the summertime, it is popping right here, right now. They're running around. They're doing so much stuff. We're in the way. We are literally in the way. And they're letting us have this delicious beer, delicious food. I'm going to get into this carne asada right now. Oh, I'll take both. I don't care. Hold on. <laughs> the flavors. It's fantastic. It's almost like a family cookout. If you're Mexican, you know what that tastes like. I'm all, the only thing I'm missing is a tortilla. I would roll that up. It's so good. Avocado's fresh. That nice smoky flavor on that avocado is fantastic. Since I have Filipinos in my family. This is what I'm really looking forward to. Filipino barbecue sauce. It's supposed to be sweet, not too sweet. You don't want to coat the whole rib. We have some peppers here for some heat. I'm gonna get all that, all that del deliciousness right there in one bite. I'm not gonna lie. I love you, Papa Jeff, but those ribs are probably the best I've ever had. Those are fantastic. And then I pair it with a delicious beer. My goodness. And we're gonna keep going this way. Ah. Oh man, look at that. Fire. Fire, he says. Have you guys been here before? It's our first time. First time? Yeah. First timers. What did you guys order? This is the yellow curry uh, mussels. Delicious. Uh, it has uh, sausage, the bread, the lime. Phenomenal. 
How you see the muscles are gone? Gone. They are gone, gone. I might get another order. Oh man, that is fantastic. Oh, it smells fantastic. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, do you guys uh, recommend this place again to anybody else? Definitely. Definitely. It's phenomenal. You guys, you guys watch Long the Beach sunset. Locals? Say it again. Are you Long Beach locals? No, we're not. We're actually, uh, I'm from LA. Riverside. Riverside? Yeah, from Riverside. I'm also from Riverside. 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 Yeah. All right. What? What? Right. He needs a ride. What possessed you guys to come down to the peninsula here today? Oh, our friend had a birthday. We had played games. We took the bikes around. We actually got invited to a stripper yacht party. It was kind of crazy, but we just we we kind of did. Uh, respectfully declined. Okay. Decided to, with the yacht <laughs> decided to eat delicious food instead. Yeah. Well, that's that that's that that's a testament. Look at that. Bows Point, Long Beach has such good food that you will decline respectfully a stripper yacht party. Respectfully. Man, what do you think? <laughs> good, Opa. Good, yeah. Good. Opa. Opa. Opa indeed. So now we have the Yellowtail. California Kolsch, but originally known as Yellowtail, yes. California. California Kolsch. So we had to change the name, but um, but originally before Sculpin, there was Yellowtail. This beer paid the bills, dude. It kept the lights on and it kind of like paved the way for beers like Sculpin to take off. It was originally. Or the flagship that built Ballast Point, you know what I mean? Wow. Yeah, easy drinking, light. It's like a San Diego centric style. Something that still has that malt backbone, still has that flavor, that character, but it's not too heavy and you can put like, you can put a lot of these away and you're not like stumbling out of the bar or the brewery, you know what I mean? Yeah. How do you like it? Yeah, this is my first time having it. I started with Sculpin, graduated to Fathom. And now I'm with Yellowtail. <laughs> you went reverse flight. Yeah, I went reverse. I, I Tarantino'd it. Yeah. I Quentin Tarantino'd it, you know? Just when you thought, yeah, you, you, you yeah. pivoted. You yeah. pizzaed when you should have french fried, who, whatever. Exactly. And it, it is very good. It's very so, easy. One of, the, one of the cool things about this beer is that it is a... So Kolsch is traditionally brewed in Cologne, Germany. And it has a designation of origin. Similar to like tequila and, Char uh, and champagne, you really can't call it Kolsch unless it was brewed there, right? So this is our California Kolsch. But it is a play on Kolsch in that we make it a little bit more, you know, SoCal. But if you really look at the recipe and you break it down, it still has a lot of German-esque components. So it has noble hops, German hops, clean fermentations, um, but we use the Kolsch strain and it gives it a little bit of that ester forward kind of flavor, um, but it's still super clean and crisp. And I think that's literally why it, 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 like, it caught fire. Besides it being, at the time, Yellowtail, and you know, fishermen love Yellowtail, so you know, it was, it was kind of like, yeah, it was, yeah. it was on brand, if you will. Um, but dude, this continues to be one of my favorite beers, and a fan favorite because it's just so easy, dude. It's like easy drinking, crushable beer. And it really has never gone away. Even with the introduction of Sculpin and a couple of other popular beers on our portfolio, this beer still crushes, dude, because people love it. It's easy drinking. And like you said, you sip it and you're like, whoa, yeah. I can have another one of these. I might have a a few. A few of them, you a know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, but it won't knock on your ass or anything like that. Oh, fantastic. Well, for all you Germans out there, you come to California, you can get some <laughs> California... California Kolsch. California the Germans, Kolsch. The Germans are going to get pissed. They're gonna wow. Like, you Kolsch. Can't. Our, go. uh, isn't Darn. it always the way since the 30s? They just get so mad at everything. <laughs> Cheers, man. Cheers. Yeah. To Prost. 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 Salud, cabrero. We're here on the second level of Ballast Point here in Long Beach on the beautiful peninsula. Let's talk to some of the patrons, see what we got here. 
Let's talk to these ladies right here. Hi. Hello. How long have you guys been patrons of Ballast Point Long Beach? Since they opened. Yeah. Since they opened. Yeah. Okay, Which fantastic. A few years back. A few years back. <laughs> few years years back. I'd say five, right? Six? It's been like five or six years now. Okay. Uh, what do you guys enjoy about this place? We really like the views and just the vibes. Great people. people. And the drinks. And the drinks. Fantastic. Uh, are you guys planning on eating tonight? Um, probably later after yeah. our first drink, we'll probably order something. I'm gonna have the fish and chips. I highly recommend that. You highly recommend you've had that before. Right, the most amazing fish and chips, which is my go to comfort food, served with incredible fries. And garlic fries yeah, around here. Like, there's garlic nice. fries right there, yeah. but they're not eating them. Right now. They're on a first date. Oh, they're on the first date. Oh, sh Again this evening. Uh, now I'm gonna want the milk steak boiled over hard ah. and a side of your finest jelly beans raw. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you guys typically drink wine or beer here? We drink wine here, which We're I big know wine girls. is probably not the best oh, oh. Oh, 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 oh. place to have wine, but you know, still a good energy, good atmosphere. So. They have good wine for you guys. They too, do. Though? They have good variety. Oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. We're drinking. Sauvignon Blanc. Last night I drank Sauvignon Blanc and a boy touched my shoulder. Sauvignon Blanc. Cheers. Cheers. I'm drinking beer, so. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Well, I'll let you guys get to it. Thank Enjoy you. your dinner or whatever you guys are having. Thank you. Be safe, huh? Thank you. All right. All right. Well, we already had the podcast. We've seen the kitchen. Now we're going to take into the brewery here at the Ballast Point in Long Beach. Non-operational at the moment, non but not for long. So let me take you back there. I'll explain a little bit about what happens when it is operational, and then we'll go from there. So my friend, welcome to what many brewers say, where the magic happens. Oh my God. Yeah, this is where, uh, this is where we make the, the liquid bread, and there's a lot of stainless steel because stainless steel is very easy to clean. And the main focus for a brewer, or for any brewery really, for that matter, is maintaining cleanliness. Okay. We always joke that brewers are glorified janitors because it's all about clean, 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 and clean. That's the most important part, sanitation. And so stainless steel, very easy to uh, maintain cleanliness. So you're gonna see a lot of that. But okay. there's a lot that goes into getting a beer made. From grain to glass, there's a lot of key components, but we're gonna be talking about hot side right now, which is the brewing part of it. Okay, now, being a novice, oh, well, well, a Master connoisseur, brewer. a connoisseur in about 30 minutes, where I started using brewery terms, <laughs> but uh, let's talk about novice. Okay. If, 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 if I was a novice, I want you to explain to me what goes on if I knew nothing about nothing about Easy. brewing beer. It's, it's really like in a barley husk or a nutshell, whatever you want to uh, look at it as, beer is pretty simple. There's four ingredients, okay. and it's how we manipulate some of these um, kind of components that are going to determine what's going to be produced at the end from a sugar content, from a fermentability con uh, standpoint. So water... Ba malted barley, mm -hmm. yeast, and hops. That's mm. beer. Beer. Delicious hops. That's that's all it is. That's all it is. And what you do with each of those ingredients is going to dramatically affect what the end product is going to be. Right. So, um, for the sake of just simplifying it, we take malted barley. So barley is grown and then it's manipulated in a malt house for us brewers to use. So they essentially take barley and they trick it into growing, into germination, so that it produces the right um, precursors to what we're gonna need on the brew house. So basically they trick it into growing and then they stop it, right? They dry it, they kiln it or drum roast it, and then they send it to us to use as brewers. So a lot of, the joke is that they do ha most of the work, but, they kind of do, in the sense. So we get malted barley, and then we're gonna play with that barley, and then we're gonna introduce it onto the brew house. As soon as we get the grain, 
then we are going to uh, mill it, which is grain comes into in, in little barley husks like that, right? Little morsels of sugar. And so what we do is we mill it first. So we crack those, uh, that grain ever so slightly to not completely pulverize it, but to crack it enough to expose the insides to, w to the water that we're going to introduce. And is that turning it into mash? God. Oh my God! Wait, you want to just do take it? it from here? Did I just do it? Just take it from I, here. Okay, so <laughs> I will be explaining. That it's, so that's it's, it's it's creating mash. So this vessel right here that you'll see with like the like the little side door opening, um, this is called the mash tun. And so we're gonna bring the uh, the malted barley into this vessel, and then we're gonna mix it with water, water at a particular temperature, and then we are gonna let it basically stew in there. And as soon as that happens. It turns into wort, W-O-R-T, and it's sugar water, essentially. Okay. Give me sugar and water. More. It's all of the fermentable sugars that we're going to need so that the yeast can later convert into alcohol, right? Um, but it starts here. We let this rest for a while, and then as soon as it's done, we want to separate the grain from this wort, the sugar water, right? Because we don't want to introduce any of the grain particulate into the next step, which is the kettle. Because when you boil it, you're going to create tannins and they're off flavors and you don't want that. So we separate it in here and then it goes into the kettle. Inside of this mash tun, there's a false bottom. So basically it's a floor, a stainless steel floor with little sieves that are thin enough to allow the liquid to drop down to the bottom, but big enough to maintain the grain and the husk on top of it, right? So it's kind of like a fresh press, uh, a French press, yeah. if you will, okay. right? Because okay. okay. we don't want any of the grain coming in. So we let that happen. We transfer that water, sugar water, over into the kettle. And the kettle's going to do exactly what you think the kettle's going to do. It's going to boil it, boil right? It and that has a bunch of different um, uses. But really what we're trying to do is we're trying to sterilize the wort. Make it clean so that it doesn't get contaminated when it enters the next step. Because if you really think about it, we're introducing yeast to it. And other organisms or microbes will be able to feed on sugar. So if we don't basically sterilize the wort, then it's going to be susceptible to contamination, right? Okay. So we boil it about 212 degrees for about an hour, but this is also where we're going to start to introduce the hops. So if you really think about the balance of beer, it's sweetness, and the only thing that's going to counteract that sweetness is bitterness. So what's going to add the bitterness component? Hops. hops. Right. So every hop has a multitude of different oils. And these oils will, under heat, go through what we call isomerization. That's going to heat these oils up to give you a perceived bitterness. And that bitterness is going to counteract the sweetness and it's going to create this balance. So for instance, um, I'm drinking the Kolsch which is a more of a malt forward beer and not too, it's not too bitter. So it's going to have less hop component than something like, like our Sculp and IPA. An IPA is going to be very bitter, right? So we're going to introduce those uh, hops into the boil and depending on how much bitterness we want to extract from it, we'll, that will determine when or how much uh, hop we're going to actually introduce to okay. the beer. So while all this is going on, uh -huh. you open that top. Mm -hmm. And you add hops. We do. So, mind the uh, the question here, but see all these paddles. Is yes. that strictly just for mixing? Well, they're mash How paddles. many times do you have to mix it? So, basically, you don't really, depending on the brewery and how it's set up, you don't okay. need those paddles. Those are oh. mash paddles. Okay. And inside of this tank, there's a series of rakes and uh, plows that when we turn it on, they will, they will automatically, automatically mix it up. But in the old days, when you didn't have that sort of technology, you would actually use a mash paddle. And you would have to like stir it like right. you were stirring porridge. And what that does, the reason why we mix it up is because if you really think about the grain bed, it's like, it's thick, right? And we want a lot of contact with each of those grains. So we need to create channels in that grain bed 
for the water to seep through and have contact with the grain because that contact is what's going to activate the enzymes inside of the grain that are going to create fermentable sugars. It's science, dude. Yeah, that's it. And so, and so we mash, um, when we mash in, we like to mix it so that we have that much more contact with uh, the grain. It's a surface area thing. Um, but we don't really use the mash paddles. And if you do, cool. Good on yeah, you. Yeah. That's old school. Yeah, old school. It's like churning butter. Yeah, like if you're, you're Amish. Yeah, yeah, you're right okay. on. And so then after it's boiled and after the, um, the, the wort is fixed and we know exactly. We're taking tests, by the way, all throughout the process to make sure that we're hitting like the. sipping tests? No, no, no. Um, oh. Actual like sugar tests. Okay. Like we need to measure the gravity of the solution. And we say gravity because it's about, it's about the particulates that are inside of the liquid that are going to determine how much fermentable sugars we actually have inside of it. So we have a bunch of refractometers or hydrometers that are going to be able to basically test the level of fermentable sugars that we have in there. And once we start hitting those numbers, after the kettle, uh, it's about you know 60 minutes to a little bit more depending on what kind of malt you're using we're going to then transfer it to a fermenter okay but before it goes there we need to drop down that temperature drastically and so it's going to go through a heat exchange that heat exchange is going to act like your car's radiator Fantastic. it's going to basically um, absorb a lot of the heat and then drop down the temperature drastically and fast because yeast doesn't like hot temperatures yeast likes She's finicky, and so she really wants exactly the temperature range that she's going to want to perform at. So, for instance, um, if we're doing an ale, for instance, we might need to drop that 213 degree wart down to 70 degrees like that, right? And so it will go through the heat exchange, it will drop down to about 70 degrees, and then it will be introduced to a fermenter. And you, you can identify it as a fermenter because of the conical bottom. You see that? You see like that cone? Okay, yeah, that's cone shape. Yeah, and then that's where we're going to um, introduce the yeast, and then it's going to do its song and dance and, and transform all of those fermentable sugars to ethanol, which is booze, is what we're going to get buzzed off of, and also a little bit of CO2, which is a natural byproduct. That, that carbonation, that thing, that thing that kind of like tickles the back of your throat, okay. that, that's carbonation. It's naturally occurring through fermentation, but then we actually have to um, add a little bit more towards the end to make sure that it's on point. But all of that is a byproduct of natural fermentation. Okay, so is it, is it almost like making whiskey where do you guys have heads and tails to this whole we dynamic? Don't. We don't. No, actually, it's all. funny that if we're making like whiskey mash, uh -huh. same process over here, but then once it gets to the fermenter, you actually don't need a lot of the um, of the safeguards that beer needs. Okay. Beer needs to be super clean, so it needs to be very isolated. Whereas whiskey mash, you can leave that open, dude. It's like it's not really going to do too much because it's going to get distilled. So we don't really have to worry about it getting contaminated because it's going to get distilled at high high pressure and temperatures. So we don't have to worry about it. But with beer. We definitely need to worry about it. We, we can't leave anything open. It needs to be sanitized. Prior to bringing in the, 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 the wart, it needs to be cleaned and sanitized or else we're going to have a bad time. Okay. So considering that it is sanitized and we did everything right, the wart will run in there and then we will introduce the yeast. The yeast will go in there, do its thing. It will ferment. We'll hit the ABV that we need. And then depending on what the style calls for, like for instance, an IPA is typically going to get a dry hop. So anybody that's wondering, well, what is a dry hop? When the beer is at a certain point of its fermentation and maturation, you see that, you see that whole way up there? We'll open that and we'll literally dump hops into it. Mm -hmm. So anytime that you get like an IPA or double IPA or something hoppy and you smell it and it smells like hops, it's most likely because we dry hopped it. We threw literal hops into it at a certain point in its fermentation and we let it steep and that's what's going to give it its aromatics. Um, after it's done in there, then um, we'll transfer it into a bright tank. And a bright tank just means that it's a different tank that's ready to receive good beer. That's probably the last uh, stage in the process before it gets kegged, bottled, or canned. Fantastic. Can I ask a stupid question? You can ask me all the stupid questions you want. 
I know nothing about all this, the process. <laughs> yeah, it's all and good. And I'm man. learning. This is fantastic. Yeah, of course. Do you guys ever use cashmere hops? Oh, who taught you cashmere? Armando. How do you, how do you, know, <laughs> how do you know cashmere, bro? Armando Gonzalez taught me about cashmere hops. So, so cashmere hops. Um, Dude, there's so many hops out there, and um, there's going to be a lot, depending on, on the evolution of this game, there, there'll be sexy hops, right? Ooh. Sexy? Exactly how sexy. These are hops. Oh, is that our Yeah, 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 sexy yeah. Hops. These are hops that are typically a little bit more expensive because um, they contain a particular essence or a profile that brewers like to use. So, like... Hop like cashmere, for instance, very juicy. It's a very, it's a very oil dense hop. So you're gonna get a lot of aromatics off it, and you're gonna get a particular profile off it. And so, when a hop is hot, like everybody wants it, like mosaic was a hot hop for a while, and then everybody started using it. It was a sexy hop for a long time. It's really hard to come by. So when you get a beer that has that hop, it's kind of cool because it's like, hey, yo, we uh, we throw cashmere in this one. <laughs> You know what with the and it tends to be it tends to be a very um, um, interesting beer because well not a lot of brewers are using it because they're expensive or they're hard to come by and so you won't see like big breweries or big craft breweries using them in abundance because they're just that expensive and you'll see some of this micro breweries and nano breweries really like starting the trend you know like mosaic was there um cashmere um strata even citra was there for a little while nectaron like all of these hops that are new they're they're deemed sexy because they're just that. They're like, ooh, they're like, oh, we got it. So we don't use cashmere in a lot of our main production beers, but our R&D facility definitely uses cashmere uh, often. Okay, yeah, that was my next question. That was the this longest guy. answer to that no, question. No, no, that was fantastic. I, my next question was, is, is Ballast Point using any hops that other breweries are not? Oh, yeah. In fact, um, Chris Takeuchi, our R&D brewer down in Little Italy, that guy gets hops before anybody else gets hops simply for the hop grower to test it. So we'll get, we'll, they'll knock on our door from time to time and they'll be like, yo, we got this TX-10075. It doesn't even have a name. Death. Yeah. <laughs> this is death. Um, but they'll, they'll, they'll allow us to play with their hops and, um, and let us try to find what it's, I don't know what its thresholds are to say aromatically bitter wise and stuff and they'll essentially use this as a little lab sometimes so we'll get we'll be able to tap into some sexy um exclusive hops Ooh. before anybody else just so that the hop provider can get some some feedback from us so that's kind of cool that's yeah that is awesome it's super dope it's super dope yeah <laughs> that's why i never knew any of that that's fantastic yeah so basically after it hits the bright tank it just needs a little bit of uh, brushing up, like we'll adjust CO2 in it to get it to the level that we think it needs to be for um, consistency standpoint, and then it's, it's ready to go. It's ready to go. It's just ready to ship. Yeah, so the barley goes to the malt house. Malt house sends it over here. We mix it with some water. It goes to the kettle. We add some hops. We take it to the fermenter. We add the yeast. We let it do its thing, and then once it's ready, we'll filter it. And then it goes to the bright tank. We'll brush it up, and then boom. Is there any taste testers? All throughout the, all, throughout every single um, point. We're tasting the wart. We're tasting the the day one, day two, day three, day seven over here in the fermenter. We're tasting it in the bright tank, and it's not getting packaged until it, it, it's it's on brand. Now, do you have any openings? Because I would like to leave said podcast and join the taste testing group. We're always looking for taste testers. Sign um, me up. It's it's. I don't know if it's paid. Oh well, that's we'll, fine. We'll definitely. Hey, you pay me in beer. Listen to you. Yeah. Well, you pay me in. <laughs> yeah, I'll drink whatever you want me to drink you just put it in front of me as long as it gets me good and tight dude in the in the in in the few hours that i've known you you've become a i don't know anything about beer to look now you're official taste tester yeah i know yeah i know i'm pretty i'm pretty smart you're a quick learner i respect your liver i respect your palate um and (laughs) my liver's struggling (laughs) but yeah thank you for all yeah that. man yeah dude well this is um, fantastic yeah and so long beach although this is not being utilized at the moment right now 
Not now. But there's plans. There's plans okay. for sure. Um, and when we get everything, it, will it expand? Will it get bigger? Um, most likely, yeah. We'll 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 be able to plug some uh, more hardware over here, and then we'll this will actually lend itself to be like a legit R and D facility. But as of right now, this with this dude, you can do a lot with no. those two fermenters, one bright and a, uh, a brew house of this size. You, you can do a lot. Now, so a little off topic. What are, what are these barrels for? Um, those might not be filled at the moment, but we do from time to time do barrel aged beers. We'll we'll rack beer into a depending on what wood it is, but a barrel, and we'll allow it to do its thing and then mature. So Ballast Point has a or had a barrel aged program um, that was pretty extensive and. We had some really good dudes behind it. Steven Anderson, uh, a guy named Alex Melendez and Will Bogart, three dudes that made all of the barrel-aged beer that we have at Ballast Point. They were, they were the, the masterminds behind it. And it's a whole nother world, dude. Yes. Like, once you start getting into barrel-aging, it's a completely different world. It's, you, it's wild. Do you have any of that Literally. at the other breweries? Uh, right now, we don't have a barrel aged program. Uh, okay. We will bring it back at some point. And once we do, it, it opens up whole new horizons because once you start introducing wood, there's actually a really good beer. I forgot, I mean, a good book. I forgot the author, but it's actually called Wood and Beer. I suggest any home brewer or pro brewer that's like interested in expanding their brewery and creating a barrel aged program, pick up that book. And it talks about all of the intricacies um, any beer dinner that I'm doing, almost always I'll introduce a, be- a barrel-aged beer because that is literally where you will get one-of-a-kind, one-off beers that you'll never have again. It's like whatever comes out of that, of, of that barrel That's will it. be very uniquely its, bar- its beer and you'll never have it again. So wow. th- th- that's... That's exciting stuff, and once you uh, yeah, yeah. once you start really to yeah like once to... you start to bleed into barrel aging, then it becomes super fun, especially for brewers. Fantastic. Yeah, man. Oh man, I mean, <laughs> oh we can we can be here all day. Yeah, we can we be here can all be week, all bro. But we're that's here. that's it in a nutshell. We're here at Long Beach Ballast Point Brewing. We got the Peninsula. We got great food. We got a brewery that's not active, but it will be active soon enough. We got wood age barrels brewing type deal going on. I don't know nothing about nothing, but (laughs) that beer is pretty exciting. I suggest you check it out in Ballast Point, any location, check it out.